A Glance in the Mirror Chapter 4 The Turn of the Century Albert was born in 1889 at 6 Salem Gardens, Moscow Road, Bayswater, which is just off Queensway. On the other side, backing onto the gardens, is Moscow Place and Moscow Road, both forming another square with Queen's Mansions, just a few doors up from his grandparents. It was a small rented house with just four rooms, two up and two down, a kitchen and an outhouse. It had a back garden which stopped at the Queen's News stable wall, belonging to a house in the next road. Paddington was now a borough, with tree-lined roads and squares. There was an enormous dis disparity between the various districts. This was apparent when getting near to Hyde Park and those houses along the canal. The areas around the railway terminus, the shops and the entertainment centres in Westbourne Grove, Queen's Road and Edgware Road gave variety and colour. The stagecoat route between Windsor and London ran alongside Kensington Gardens, and during school holidays Bert would sit in the public gardens and watch the coaches bowling along the road to Windsor or Hurlingham, with the guard whipping up the horses and blowing his horn. All traffic travelled at the pace of the horse. Carriages of many different styles abounded. Horse transport was the usual mode of travel for both individuals and groups of people. Most of the carriages were privately owned, although there was a public horse-drawn system called the omnibus. Some people had a pony and trap or small governess cart drawn by very small ponies. Occasionally goats pulled the country carts. Every shop had its own errand boy who delivered goods by hand, the older boys doing a bigger round using a pony-drawn cart. Very soon, very few people carried their own shopping, relying upon the shop's delivery service. Men drove drew's bray, drays drawn by hu four huge horses with their jingling horse brasses and bells. The driver, in bowler hat, was sitting high up or, or at the front, covered with a trial pauling wrap fastened over his knees. Carrier vans collected and delivered heavier goods on either two or four wheeled carts. Two paraffin oil or acetylene lamps lit his way. These vans travelled around in a particular route known by the inhabitants. If their services were required, a note had to be pinned to your door or gate. Deliveries were also made from the railway stations, guaranteeing a door-to-door -door service. In the late Victorian age, many children from poorer families were thought of as an investment and put out to work as errand boys, carriers of beer, street cleaners and railway station porters. Others held horses, carried trucks and delivered parcels. They stood at doorways ready to call a cab and help cabbies who were drunk. The numbers occupied thus were estimated between 10 to 20,000. Many became matchboys and street sellers, carrying food and fruit. They did even the smallest thing to make what they could to help out at home. As soon as dawn broke, they were to be seen outside every marketplace, ready to take up a barrow. Others traded by the queues of shops and theatres to entertain and amuse the patrons by their antics. Workmen of the period could be recognised by their heavy moustaches and heavy boots, with hobnails, thick twilled trousers, coarse worsted jackets, a waistcoat supporting a watch or key ring, and a cap or billycock hat, a short top hat, but all very well worn, probably cast-offs. Some may wear smocks, overalls, or wear a uniform that would distinguish him from other workers. A middle-class man, whose face was richly adorned by hair in the shape of mutton chops, full beard with moustache, wore a universally prescribed silk plush top hat on a stiff blocked base made of canvas, a black or dark blue frock coat with a fashioned waist and skirt, with straight edges to about knee height 
open at the front by curving or wrapping the skirt front round to the back. A pocketed silk lined velvet waistcoat with a man's watch usually on a silver chain. Trousers were fashioned tight in white, grey, fawn or striped held up by braces. A pinned satin cravat beneath a studded collar band topped a mid-length thigh-length shirt with separate point-up starch collars and linked secured folded cuffs. For special occasions a starch frilly shirt front and tied silk bow and beneath all would be a one-piece long johns and silk socks held in place by garters and thrust into ankle boots. By 1865 the very wide skirts for women supported by crinolines which took over from tight-laced corsets were being superseded by tunic dresses, waisted blouses with a bustle at the back soon to be replaced. A waterproof cloak with hood, heightened boots, the essential hat and parasol completed the picture. Within the homes of Albert's friends, elaborate rules of etiquette were observed. In middle-class homes, one had to dress for dinner in full evening dress. Lace curtains were de rigueur, and Sunday best clothes worn. No games were played, no shops were open, no theatres played, and only the Bible read. No running in the streets or parks. Decorum was observed at all times, and no shouting ever. The parlour was used as a special room for Sundays, entertaining and greeting guests. For the family, it was open day on high days and holidays, and Christmas, of course. Little Bertie attended Sunday school aged four in 1893 at the school in Queen's Road. The girls and boys were formed up in ranks of two, then, holding hands, marched off to St. Matthew's Church, St. Petersburg Place, Bayswater, led by a master and mistress. It was here that Albert spent two years at the infant school. His family were relatively well off, having a father skilled in his own painting and staining business with a full order book. The school's fees were one penny or two pennies per week. There was, however, a considerable variation of fees depending on the number of children from one family going to the same school or whether there was sickness or lack of footwear, a fairly common occurrence. By 1891, sufficient money was made available by the government to provide free school places. When Albert went to school in 1893, he didn't have to attend school with his fee in his pocket. The minimum age children could then leave school was 11. It would take another six years to push this up to 12. At that time, education in London was led the way in curriculum innovation, promoting music, drill and object lessons, some instruction about the world around them, science, history and geography. Lessons other than the three R's were considered class lessons. For the older children, two other specific subjects were included. The question about the provision of a piano was much debated. Finally, it was left to the head teacher knowing what funding from grants was available. All round the age of 12 children went to school, went to church, was unconfirmed, afterwards allowed to attend communion services. For several weeks before confirmation there would be classes of instruction to learn the Creed, Ten Commandments, the Catechism, the Lord's Prayer and other religious works. On Sundays, communion, the girls would wear long white sleeved dresses, white shoes, veils, and the boys their best suits and well-shone shoes, starched collars to their white shirts and buttoned-up waistcoats. Those parents who didn't attend church considered wicked, wicked and lacking in respect. Their children did, however, not out of choice, but duty. 
Parents used the Sunday school as a way of maintaining good social habits, a quiet peace period at home and free education. What was engendered lasted the child all its life, forming community spirit and social cohesion. Most children went to Sunday school and attended one proper service, morning or evening. At Christmas they went twice a day. The Sunday school lessons considered, consisted of Bible readings, religious instructions, righteous stories with a moral theme, and learning the collect, which is a single prayer of the day. Picture stamps of biblical scenes were collected and mounted in an album. Hymns for young children were sung to the accompaniment of a piano. All the people were dressed in their Sunday best. Children in particular were clothed in, clothed in shirts stiff with starch. The congregation knew where to sit. Families and individuals usually occupied the same pews. The congregation knelt down and said a prayer or to be asked for forgiveness before the service began. The high altar, a covered table, was reached by several steps around which were displayed several oil paintings depicting biblical scenes. The chancel was imposingly large, being separate from the body of the church by a wrought iron grill. There were always on hand many servitors, functionaries, in high church dress. The services were recited and sung, except for the lessons. There was a special service for women who hadn't long given birth. This was called Churching for Women and was a service to cleanse them and release them from sin. There was no such thing as feminism or feminist movements. Why this should be only for women was never explained, nor how they had been sinful. At St. Matthew's Church, pews could be rented when the upper classes, particularly the nobility and aristocracy, attended, a footman followed them in. He was dressed in a frock coat, white, skin-tight trousers and buckled shoes. His job was to carry the Bible and prayer book to be handed over to their masters at the door. Pew openers directed the ordinary parishioners into their strictly guarded, rented and paid-for seats. Title folk were ushered into their pews, which had doors and sometimes separate internal roofs, by attendants who saw them in and spread blankets over their legs. These attendants were women who had black poke bonnets and white aprons. Services were <coughs> recited by heart, particularly the hymns, for many of the parishioners couldn't read. The sermons were often long and difficult to hear because of the echo. The rector constantly instructed his parishioners that they should worship all day Sunday. However, the evening services were those best attended. The aristocracy attended church in the mornings. The evening services attended by their servants and those who were too busy at their household tasks looking after the horses and farm animals. In the winter months, the church interiors were lit by the soft glow of oil lamps, which cast mysterious shadows over the walls and pillars, making the gloomy, cold and damp environment eerie, to small children frightening. The congregation sat in the same seat every week, and woe betide if you sat on somebody else's. You always had to be on your best behaviour. Albert knelt down with everybody else and said a prayer asked for forgiveness before waiting for the service to begin. He was supposed to read the collect for the day, or a psalm. Everyone knew the service order by rote, and most of the hymns. At the collection, a halfpenny would be dropped in the plate. It was not unusual for the gentry to have their own family pews, and the added luxury of a couple of heated rooms where they could meet, entertain, and retire to. The beadles kept order, and the poor out. 
At the end of the service, the parishioners walked out into the blackness of the night, and those who had a long way to get back home would light candles in their lamps that flickered on the footpaths and disappeared into the night. However distant the journey, there was little fear of being accosted by vagabonds or scoundrels, for the congregation all left together. You could hear the happy good nights all around you as the cheery calls echoed through the night air. The clear night sky enabled you to recognize the constellations and sometimes see a falling star and get a wish. It was a ritual on a Sunday for the ladies and gentlemen from the surrounding churches to perambulate around the squares and gardens after matins. This walk ended up strolling down Lancaster, Lancaster Walk past Speaks Monument to the Albert Memorial. This walk was termed the Parade, and it was here that the bonneted women and attending dandies would be bobbing and nodding to their acquaintances, all showing off their latest fashions. The riders had a similar parade. Both men and women wore top hats. The women rode side saddle. The society dandies and their simpering bells disporting in their barouches while chattering loudly, loudly fluttering their fans. Some of the small children would be riding their ponies beside their parents, giggling and chattering like sparrows. The servants would be at home preparing the meal and tidying the rooms ready for their masters to return, when they would disappear to return later in the afternoon. The nannies would be pushing the enormous sided prams, the lar largest of which displayed wealth. They kept to the railings path. Regent's Park, planned by Nash, displayed the zoological exhibits, a favourite place for the nannies to stroll, needing one shilling for the pleasure. This display, performed by the rich, occurred in all of London's royal parks. This droll ostentation by the bourgeoisie had a great effect upon my father, who saw it as a disparaging display of wealth from those who might also cast a glance of disdain at the unfortunates who did not have an equal society standing. After church, Bertie would walk to the top of the road towards Kensington Gardens. At that time, Princess Louise, Duchess of Argyle, occupied the Royal Palace of Kensington. When he got to the park, he had to learn to walk and never run because the park keeper would soundly admonish him for des desecrating the Sabbath day. The royal parks, originally reserved for the aristocracy, were now open to the public, as was Regent's Park. About a third of the occupants of Nash's terraces were in business. Kensington Gardens was not open to the public for its first ten years after its inauguration but kept as a great private estate for royalty and the aristocracy. During the week, city life was one of organised chaos. There were few women, particularly in public areas. There was a charging, shifting of people, mainly men, going to and from work. Clerks were in abundance, being the main form of employment for the non-serving cl servant classes. They would not only populate their offices, but be rushing, delivering letters, plans and manuscripts. The water carts would be out laying the dust, crossing keepers dressed in their uniform, keeping their particular spots clean of mud and dung, the pot boys and shop staff lifting open the hatches to the cellars, rolling back the blinds and pulling open the shutters. The street life during the day was a cosmopolitan with a frantic grating, crunching, swirling of speeding horse-drawn traffic, the hackney drivers vying with each other to get back to the pitch as soon as possible, where they were the worst, darting here and there without a buy or leave. During early morning and after work the streets returned to almost village life. Over and behind the shops family life progressed. There were three main commercial and business groups, the sellers, the buyers and the providers. 
This last group contained the service and maintenance staff, builders and repair people who lived in the so-called village. <laughs>